Hello and welcome to Off The Shelf Reviews. I've always enjoyed the Chenard Institute. And I'm Gary. And today we're going to review and discuss Hellbound, Hellraiser 2, which came out in 1988 by director Tony Randall. Ian, why don't you give us the synopsis for Hellbound? Well, Hellraiser 2 takes place literally just only a few hours after Hellraiser 1. Kirsty has been taken to the Chenard Institute to be investigated for the dead bodies that are all in her family's homes. And Dr. Chenard, who runs the Institute, has come across the mattress that Julia died on and also the box. Dr. Chenard uses one of his patients, Tiffany, to solve the box so that he may himself go to the Cenobites dimension. Before Hellraiser 1 had even released, while it was still in post-production, the studio, excited with what they had on their hands, yeah. greenlit Hellbound Hellraiser 2 immediately. Although Clive Barker was pretty hesitant to return as the director, uh, he passed on the helm to Tony Randall, who from here would go on to direct Ticks with Seth Green. Yeah. Uh, anyway, he was pr he was uncredited in Hellraiser 1, except for having many, many thanks. And he was also a co-editor of the first Hellraiser movie. Yeah. So it's interesting that Clive Barker handed the, handed the helms to him, although the original story does still come from Clive Barker. The writer for this film is Peter Atkins, who would actually go on to write Hellraiser 3 and 4, and then he would go on to write Wishmaster and two, three, and four. <laughs> <laughs> also, most of the original cast return. Uh, Ashley Lawrence returns to play Kirsty. Yeah. Claire Higgins reprises her role as Julia. Doug Bradley returns as Pinhead. Unfortunately, Andrew Robinson did not return to play Larry. And the original script for the film heavily involved having that actor return to reprise the role. Yeah. Which does explain some of the hasty rewrites that came towards the end of the film. Uh, it's still never been confirmed as to why he actually did not want to return to the role. Uh, I, I'd been reading up on some notes about him, actually, and it it kind of came down to the fact that he read the pre-script for Hellraiser 2 and didn't particularly like the way that his character was going. You know, maybe there wasn't just enough screen time for him. He was a big, thick part of the story, but just him himself wasn't on screen enough, so he kind of just... Yeah. Well, I also heard that it was the studio not wanting to pay the returning actors any more money. Uh, uh, yeah. There was a, a problem with the fact that the studio was going bankrupt at the time. Yeah. And so it kind of, despite Hellraiser being an you know, overwhelming success, uh, they I think they might have even limited the budget for the second film. Or it may have remained the same. And so, yeah, some of the actors were maybe not paid as much as what they would have liked. And that's what I heard why he didn't want to return well they they omit the ending in this for hellraiser one hellraiser we didn't actually do this in the first review but at the end of hellraiser one uh kirsty places the the box inside a fire and the homeless man that had been following her around in the film kind of just steps into the fire turns into a skeletal dragon picks up the box and flies off so for me hellraiser one literally like a lot of original horror movies just ends right there you know there you go you could watch hellraiser one and just n never see any of the sequels but with the with the with the company they want to make a lot of more money they want to make a franchise out of it let's make a sequel and we'll just ignore that dragon thing at the end we'll just pick up right where the film ends up we'll have this big old flashback which is nice because it does include the extended cut of Larry slash Frank's head exploding. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but in the last review, I was really excited about watching Hellraiser 2. I hadn't watched it in ages. So watching the first movie got me all excited to watch Hellraiser 2. Then I sat down and watched it. And now I'm sat in front of the camera and I'm like... It's not as good as I remember. It's still, for me, the the better Hellraiser movie. Actually, I say that before I've even watched Hellraiser 3. I could really fucking enjoy that one. <laughs> uh, but the issue I have is that, yes, they have a recap at the beginning of the film of what happened in Hellraiser 1. And then you kind of join Kirsty as she's kind of telling the police officer 
about what happened. He, you know, the police officer has come across her, come across all the dead bodies that they found that Julia has I been... think it's interesting that the, the first place they've placed her is in a mental asylum. Yes. <laughs> not, even, not even taking her to jail or anything. It's literally, we're, we're, we're going to take you to the Chenard Institute because that's literally nearby. And... You know, like we said in the first in the first review, you're not. It's a, like a nowhere universe. It's not. It's, it's, it doesn't tell you it's America. It doesn't tell you it's England. The first movie, I always thought it was England because just just the way it's filmed. In this one, it's like we're still kind of filming in England, but we're trying to make it more American. So here's the police officers wearing American <laughs> outfits. We've got the detective. You know, you always need a detective in the film. And the way that the de the detective turns to Kirsty and. She, He's like, tell me what happened. Don't lie to me. So she tells the truth. Cenobites, her uncle resurrecting from the dead and sucking the life force out of strange men, her evil stepmother wanting to kill her father and them stealing his skin. And the detective's like, I don't believe you. And just to prove you, prove to you that I don't believe you, Kirsty, I've sent your boyfriend home. The boyfriend that literally saw everything at the end of the first movie. And gave the exact same story. And gave the exact same story. We've sent him home, but we're locking you up. Uh, don't worry about him. He's okay. We sent him home hours ago. <laughs> he had some story to tell. Who the fuck are you? A good, good way to write a character out. Yeah, I, I like he was it. pretty much non-essential to the to the story <laughs> yeah, whatsoever. He, so. he, was, he was a useless character in the first movie, but it's 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 just that way of you know she's like handcuffed or tied to a bed or her head spinning around with all the crazy shit going on, and he's like, I I don't believe her, so uh, <laughs> we'll wait until Doctor Chenard turns up. I do like the way that Kirsty is not the victim anymore. She's not the virginal victim anymore. She's she's kind of like the survivor, you know if if. I you know I don't really use it, but if if Hellraiser is Kirsty's alien, you know now she's the badass Ripley that we've kind of gotten used to. Ashley Lawrence, actually, I actually think she does deliver a much stronger performance in this film, even though it's only a year later. Um, I think her experience on Hellraiser has helped shape and prepare the character yes. as well as the actor to portray what needs to come in this film. Yeah. Interestingly, though. In the first film, Clive Barker and Doug Bradley and the other actors behind the Cenobites discussed what the human origins were if, in fact, these demons did have human origins. Yes. And they originally had loads of ideas and actually almost set to work on filming. Unfortunately, due to a budget cut, they couldn't film any of that material. Right. And so literally all that remained of it is is Doug Bradley playing Captain Elliot Spencer actually opening the lament configuration yes. right at the beginning of the film? Yeah, which is interesting, and it does thankfully give the actor some actual screen time without the makeup on, and it does you know help add to the mystery even more so now knowing that he was a human, but just figuring out that he was a World War One captain. Yeah, maybe wondering why he would even want to open the box. And my theory is that he wanted to open the box to perhaps. Uh, you know, achieve some sort of power to help him perhaps win the war. Yeah, or or you know, post traumatic stress. You know, he he'd seen all of his buddies die, and he's you know he's not married. He's taken too much opium. You know, he's pushed much like Frank in the first movie. He's pushed all of his senses to the extremes, and now somebody said, "Oh, no, open this box. You might like what's happening." That opening is fucking phenomenal, you know. The transformation sequence. Yeah. The hammers n hitting the nail on the head. Yeah, <laughs> and, and it just the intercuts of him screaming, but then yes. at the same time him having like a grin on his face. You know, and then you get that little narration from from Pinhead about, you know, the suffering and how he just enjoys it and things like that. The suffering. The sweet suffering. That, for me, really does set the tone for the film. And again, you know, I'm given more lore about the Cenobites and about this Pinhead character, which for me is what's the exciting aspect and part of the film. Yeah, and... I, that's, that's it. I, that's why I started to kind of start to lose some of what I used to really love Hellraiser 2 for. 
I've realized that I used to love Hellraiser 2 because of the added lore that they brought in, the background, the the obviously I don't want to spoil too much, but the 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 the, the depths that they will go to within the hell dimension, which is absolutely amazingly portrayed. Everything human like, you know, your cliched horror story stuff. Well, I that's I, the stuff that kind of gets me. Yeah, well, I mean, you say it's cliche now, but like I said, I mean, Hellraiser 2 was the, the first Hellraiser movie I ever saw. Yeah. And it always stuck with me because of its truly shocking visuals. And for me, you know, we've seen, just had the pinhead stuff and we had the flashback stuff. Yeah, yeah. But the the bit that jarred with me and stuck with me the most is when Chenard goes to the maintenance floor of the mental asylum. Yeah. And that for me, was absolutely terrifying to think that, you know, you have the nice hospital wards, yes, yet yeah, somewhere yeah. in the fucking basement, the most extreme cases are being kept and locked away, and he keeps sliding the doors open, and we're seeing these human monstrosities. Yeah. And that, for me, that stuck, because that scared me. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, the imagery in Hellraiser 2 is amazing. It's like... Chenard gets most of the best sequences. The brain operation that he's doing at the beginning. You know, you got the woman wide awake. You know, her eyes are open and she's numb like, oh, what's going on? And then he's coming along and he's picking this bit out here and he's drilling in that bit there. All of Chenard's stuff around the hospital is, is, is really well done because it just, yeah, it sets you on edge. There's that nice little walk-in that he does. He walks, he walks from the outside of the hospital and it's all sunny and the sky's blue and all the patients are walking around. He walks inside the ward and he's just like, hey, how are you doing? How's it going? And you've got that old man who says, uh, was that 105 years and he still doesn't know my name. So it's like, ah, it's a little joke. And then Chenard steps out onto the basement floor and all you're hearing is screams and you see the steam and it's like his own personal hell that he, is he checking up on these people or is he enjoying tormenting them? The stuff that gets me, though, is, once again, the relationship stuff between Kirsty and William Hope's character, Kyle. He looks strangely familiar. Yeah. You always were an asshole, Gorman. You know, William Hope, he's probably just, what, two years after Aliens, and this is his next film that he's going to be in. But... It's, it's just got this gormless look about him. You know, he's he's Dr. Chenard's assistant, you know? But he's questioning everything that Dr. Chenard is doing because Dr. Chenard is, is thus investigating Kirsty, And Kirsty is telling him all the information about... And we get another flashback about the first movie. So we had a flashback at the beginning and now we've got a flashback in the middle. Way to fill the film out, guys. He gets all this information about the box and the mattress and how they've got to burn it because Ju uh, Julia died on it. But Chenard's like, mm, I know everything about the Lament configuration box. I've been studying it for years. I've got like seven different Lament configuration boxes at home. Kyle overhears him on the phone, yeah. ordering the mattress to be delivered to his house. Yeah. He's like, well, that's pretty fucking strange. How has he managed to? <laughs> how has he managed to work that? Yeah. Last I heard, that mattress was bagged and tagged and sent down to the police station. Police for, station. Yet somehow he manages to get the evidence to his house. I don't know. I guess he's paying these people off. You know, wealthy, whatever. Yeah, wealthy. Well, and so, Kyle has overheard him and follows him to his house. You know, I think I'd react the same to seeing all of this. Hellraiser lore just scattered about the place and the reveal of additional lament configurations, which, you know, watching the first film, you kind of theorise that there would be more. And this film shows you there are there are more. Yeah. Perhaps they open different gateways. Perhaps they have different powers. They access different Cenobite lords. Who knows? It's never really explained because every box we see open always opens to the same place anyway. <laughs> It does then lead to him believing that everything that Kirsty is has said to him is real yeah. because we get Julia coming out of the mattress. Not before we have Mr. Browning, I believe he's called, 
cutting away at invisible insects, crawling yes. all over him. It is revolting and disgusting, and the bodysuit is great. And I also like the fact that this actor is the guy who played Skinless Frank yes. in the original Hellraiser. Yes. So yet again, an actor whose face you couldn't see in the original film is actually visible in this one, which is just nice. And it is a pretty terrifying and gruesome resurrection. Yes. This, see, this sequence, like I said, is, is really good because you wonder what Chenard's doing when he brings... Well, you, you kind of wonder, but you kind of know it's a Hellraiser movie. He's brought this guy back and he just hands in the razor. Just like, here you go. And the guys just seem so happy to start cutting these invisible insects off of him. But the blood obviously opens the doorway. Julia pulls herself out from this mattress dimensional gateway, sucks the life from him, and she's back. But it's so creepy, you know, because Chenard is infatuated with her already. Well, he's excited because this is now because I, I imagine that he has spent a lifetime probably collecting these cubes yeah. and trying to open them without any success. Or he was aware of what would happen if he opened them and probably didn't want to open them himself. And so maybe he's just testing the water of the possibility of this being real. And now it's been actualized as Julia is resurrected. He didn't know what he was going to bring back necessarily. Yeah. But it's confirmation to him that it's real. See, I got, I got to question Julia's resurrection though. See, because... Obviously, in the first movie, the blood fell on the on the attic floor, which is where Frank had died. Yes. So she's died on this mattress, and she comes out of it. But she comes out, and it, is it because she didn't spend so much time there, and it's well, only been quickly? Because she's able to come out quite more fleshy than Frank was. Yes. And then, as obviously she goes through the whole life force sucking procedure like we followed in the first movie, she actually gets her skin back. Uh, towards the sort of end of the film, she explains that Leviathan, her god, the center of this hell universe, yeah. actually brought her back and sent her to go and find souls. So I imagine she was given the boost to yeah. go and do what, what she does. That would explain it, yes. Why do you think I was allowed to come back? I brought you. Now you know. The skinless man in Hellraiser really worked. Yeah. Mummifying her in this one also really works because it is a really disturbing image knowing that she's just all flesh yes. underneath underneath that mummy suit. It, but what's even really cringeworthy is when she starts making out oh, with Doctor Chenard, that, yeah. and his hands start reaching down oh. to squeeze arms like this. There's, there's nothing there. How are you squeezing bits? <laughs> that's, that's it. It gets it gets quite just like in the first movie. It gets quite sexual, you know, the whole making out with a fleshy person covered in bandages, and you're just like, you deserve to go to hell if that if that's what you're enjoying. It's it's, it's kind of wrong. Now, at this point in the film, I started to realise that there was a lot of plot holes or the continuity just not making sense. Yes. Right. Now, in order to... Just looking at this timeline-wise, Kyle has followed Chenard to the house. Yeah. Watched Julia be resurrected. Kyle immediately runs back to the asylum to find Kirsty to let her go. And she decides, no, I'm going to go to where Julia's just been resurrected to get that box you just told me is there. Yeah. So I can go and rescue my father, who I'm having nightmares about still being in hell. Yes. So the two of them from the asylum then make their way to Chenard's house. And so but by the time they return to Chenard's house, yeah. Julia has already feasted on like six people. Now, we've already seen them go back and forth from the asylum to Chenard's house. It doesn't take that much time. And I'm just wondering how she managed to cram in feasting on all these corpses in the space of a couple hours. Yeah, see, that, that's what threw me off. And I could only figure out that, and it, I'm still spitballing here, that Chenard's house must be like 10 minutes away. But it doesn't then explain why it took so long I for know. Kirsty and Kyle to get there. I know, I know. Like I said, it's one of those film things, but it's like, it's like the victims as well. I think to myself... You know, part of me is like, oh, Chenard's just taking patients out from his basement. But it's the fact that the the decomposition of the victims as well varies. 
You know, you've got naked women whose ha faces have half melted. You've got full-blown skeletons that are down. You've got fucking fleshy skeletons that are still wearing their clothes. So I'm like, so why did you take the clothes off that person? Yeah. But you yeah. left the clothes on that they person. They all look good, as corpses do. Yeah. <laughs> but that's a special effect. Kyle and Kirsty get to the house and they're trying to be really, really quiet. So Kyle decides that, hey, I'll go upstairs, you know, and you stay down here. He goes up the stairs and comes across Julia, who, like I said, has got her skin back at this point. And so you, he doesn't recognize her, but questions her about if it is still in the attic and willingly just walks into the attic. He doesn't even try to shout to Kirsty, hey, Kirsty, there's a fucking crazy woman up here and there's little hanging bodies. You know, it's like, he just walks into the room and like we said, he's already an asshole, so might as well just finish it off. And Julia just fucking kills him. So, you know, now that Julia's fully restored, it's now time for her to have a reunion with Kirsty. You have surprisingly good taste in men. She pretty much explains that, yeah, she's back. And Julia tells us that she is the queen of hell. And as we were told, she was intended to be the film and the series villain. They didn't tell you, did they, Kirsty? They changed the rules of the fairy tale. I'm no longer just the wicked stepmother. Now I'm the evil queen. So come on. Right, and so she right. announces herself as the queen of hell. And yeah. Come at me. And she does. She knocks Kirsty clean out. I don't know why they don't kill Kirsty here and now while yes. they have the chance. Chenard turns up and he is brought along with him Tiffany, who we saw a glimpse of earlier on in the asylum being, you know, um, a mute person with no family who is a master at solving puzzles. Yes. Tiffany is then tasked with opening the lament configuration and Pinhead turns up and calls off his other Cenobites from making the kill. And this is something I didn't mention in the Hellraiser review, is what separates the Cenobites and the Pinhead character from every other horror movie villain slasher. Yes. Which he, is that Pinhead is not just going to turn up and kill you and stab you and disappear. If he's going to claim you, you're going to be suffering for an eternity. But he's not just there to kill anyone. And he understands that Tiffany is a prop. She was being used by somebody else yes. to open the box. And that, so he calls off the Cenobites. And that's what makes Pinhead and the Cenobites so much more interesting than a lot of these other villains. No, it is not hands that call us. It is desire. I've just actually realized this on camera. Hellraiser 2, Pinhead doesn't kill anybody. No. Wow. How have I not just realized that? I've seen fucking Hellraiser 2, like, shitloads of times, and always sat there like, oh yeah, fucking Pinhead's a badass. No, he's not. Doesn't kill a single person in the sequel. Not one. Doesn't even torture anybody. You know, he literally has, what, the flashback sequences, you know, and then he has this part with Tiffany, and then he won't turn up again until later on in the film. <laughs> Now that Pinhead and the Cenobites have been recalled, the hell world remains open. Yes. And so Julia gets to lead Chenard through the bowels of hell. Tiffany decides she's going to go for a wonder. Kirsty wakes up and goes, oh look, hell's open. I guess I can go and find my find father my now. now. So yeah. now we get to wander through the bowels of hell. But I, li I like this really, I like this design. There's this maze-like... Uh, Leviathan dimension place. It's it's like, I mean, we're talking 1988 and you only get a few glimpses, but the the portraits, I suppose they did, the painting, the map paintings, the map yeah. paintings they work really well. I like the effect of that diamond shaped black laser shadow thing fucking firing and forcing, I don't know, your, your deepest, darkest nightmares to come out of you and things like that. 
I like the tunnels that they go into because, you know, it just makes it feel dark and dingy and like you don't want to be there. I like the camera with the way it just spins around them as they're in decision as to which direction to yes, go in. Yes, yes, multiple tunnels. But it's like you said as well, we're following Kirsty who is chasing... She's already received this vision of this skinless form telling her that he's in hell and needs help. And so she immediately assumes that it's her father, which... You know, if we're going with notes, we assume that this is part of the story that they were making for Hellraiser 2 until it was changed. It works well, I suppose, because she gets there and realises that it's not her father who's being tortured, but it's Frank. And so the original actor from the first movie reprises his role again and shows us that, yo, this is my little hotel room. You know, I've got these holographic women that keep coming out and they're know. there to perpetually tease him because of course frank being a sex hungry monster yes is now being eternally teased and he grasped the idea basically if he got Kirsty in there he would actually have somebody physical and tangible for him to rape for eternity yeah, yeah if he wasn't already the creepy uncle you know <laughs> but that's, that's it she she has the fight with him it's not not much of a fight but well she doesn't have a fight she just kind of takes the sheet and sets the house on fire yeah sets it all on fire which burns his skin off and turns him back into the fleshy form that we recognize from the first movie and then julia turns up and she has tiffany and they're like, oh, you know, okay, this is this is now one big reunion. And Frank's like, you're with me, come with me. But Julia, being powered by the Leviathan now, realizes she does she she's out of the out of the power of Frank and rips his fucking heart out. Nothing personal, babe. Now there comes the question. What happens in the hell world when you're already dead and suffering for eternity in there? What happens when you're killed in there? I put it down to the fact that he's dead, but then he'll come back to life, but he'll remember what it was like to have his heart ripped out. Yeah, I guess that's kind of the case. And still has <laughs> to sit there in that room being tortured by all that shit. What I also like is Tiffany's sort of small personal hell. Where she runs across this sort of urban carnival. It's basically the Hall of Mirrors. Yes. Laughing clowns and images of her mother asking asking the doctors for to help her daughter while, you know, a gloved hand sort of masks her face, yeah. which would suggest that, you know, she brought this gifted child to Chenard. Chenard went, I'm going to have a use for you in about 10, 15 years. Kill the mother, keep her forever locked up, solving puzzles, yeah. train her for the day. It's the freaky image you get of Imogen Borman in, like, a tiny fucking schoolgirl's outfit with pigtails. You know? It just... Come, at the age that she is in this movie, sat there with the blonde hair, you know, and the jumper looking like she's 17, 18 years old. That works. Getting the exact same image inside this fucking outfit with pigtails and pulled up white socks. I'm like, that's just a weird <laughs> sexual fantasy Dr. Chenard's having, you know. <laughs> and we're having to deal with her mother as well. This, this is what I mean. A lot of the stuff in Hellraiser 2 I do like, but there just seems to be too much padded on top. This extra mother character of Dr. Chenard, help me. You, you don't ever find out who the mother, if, if it actually is our mother, you, you assume it is. You don't actually know hap, know what actually happened to the mother. You only assume Chenard killed her. You know, you only, you don't even get like a big catch up with, with Tiffany fighting against Chenard and defeating him and finding out the truth and then using it against him like you do in all these movies. Well, no, it, Tiffany is the one that actually kills Chenard. Eh, uh, that's, that's debatable. Well, she solves the box, which does kill Chenard. No, what kills Chenard is, is his head gets ripped off. Yeah, the moment Tiffany finishes solving the puzzle box. No. Yes. He gets his tentacles stuck yeah. in the floor and gets pulled away by it. No, after Tiffany solves the puzzle box. Okay, beg the, the differ, the, the differ. Kirsty meets up with the Cenobites, and this annoys me because... You know, in and because it does slightly go against Pinhead's character that yeah. he had an agreement with Kirsty in the first film to take them to Frank, to which uh, to which she does, and they do take Frank. 
Yeah. But then they decide, you know what, Kirsty, we want to explore your flesh too, so you're coming with us. And that's why Kirsty has to run away and sends them all back to hell. Of course, now Kirsty is in hell and she has the hell box, which she desperately tries to send the Cenobites back to where they already come from. <laughs> and so I love Doug Bradley's performance yet again yes. as Pinhead. Yeah. Unfortunately, Grace Kirby did not reprise her role as the female Cenobite. And I did prefer the look of her in the original film compared to Barbie Wilde's uh, version of the Cenobite. They also heavily changed Chatterer and they gave him eyes. Now, yeah. it is the same actor playing Chatterer, but the sort of changes that they made to him kind of lessened the impact of him a little bit. Yeah. So yeah. I prefer Chatterer from the original. And uh, Butterball, yet again, also being played by Simon Bamford. And their reappearance, knowing it's mostly the same actors, is great. Yes. But they say that Kirsty tricked them. And now that they're, they're, they're not going to let her do it again. Go on. But trick us again, child. And your suffering will be legendary, even in hell. And I'm like, when did Kirsty trick you? Yeah. You know, the first, sorry, the first time they're in, she encounters them, Pinhead's like, yep, you're free, go and explore the depths of hell. And he just laughs, because we've got an eternity to know your suffering. Yeah. But then when they re-find her, they're like, yep, yeah, no more puzzles, no more games, you're coming with us. And it's like, Why? But it's, it's there's no one. real motivation other than they're just really curious about Kirsty. Then get the, the catch up from the beginning of the film where you know Kirsty's got the picture of Elliot Spencer and she comes across the Cenobites and they're like, Yeah, yeah, we're gonna tear you to pieces. She's like, Wait, yeah, hold on, you recognize this guy, you know? And Pinhead's like, mm, No, and she's like, Look closer, look closer, doesn't it look like Doug Bradley? Someone else, do you think, escaped us? He starts to look at the image and yeah, it's a cool character arc. I used to like it. I used to like the, the cool character arc of, oh my God, he's going to realize he's human now. And you know, it's, it's going to bring out his humanity side. But at the same time, this is the Hellraiser series. And I know how the films get later on where I'm like, actually, no, I don't want you to. I want, I want fucking Pinhead to look at the picture and it to just burst into flames and then to go, I don't give a shit, Kirsty. Here, here's like five chains into your flesh and now I'm going to pull you apart. But he doesn't. He actually, he stops and questions it. And while obviously Kirsty and Tiffany have been running around the hell dimension, Julia has taken Dr. Chenard to the Leviathan and the Leviathan has now gone, actually, Dr. Chenard, you're so fucking evil and know so much about flesh that I want to turn you into a new Cenobite. This is, this is possibly one of my all-time favourite sequences of the Hellraiser franchise, uh, is, the, is the, the, the death of Dr. Chenard and the birth of Cenobite Chenard. But it's the way, you know, he comes across this room now. He's... He, he comes across the room with all the Cenobites in and Kirsty and Tiffany because he's chasing them. And the Cenobites are just like, actually, we don't want to be the evil guys anymore. We want to be the good guys. We're going to fight Dr. Chenard. Which is where I... Why? Would, would, that this is the thing that I don't know because Pinhead and the other Cenobites never really mention Leviathan. I don't know yeah. whether Leviathan is sort of their boss as well. And I yeah. don't know if Dr. Chenard is a Cenobite. I think he's something else. And to think, I hesitated. I think he's some sort of creature because he does he is not bound by the rules of the Cenobites. No, no. And so I don't think he's a Cenobite. I think he's a monster of some other creation. And from what I could gather is that because Chenard does go on a killing spree throughout the hospital. Yes. Where yeah. we see that he's got dozens of, of lament configurations now. And all of his patients are in the process of solving them. And I'm wondering whether this is because Leviathan or whatever it is, is feeding like crazy to support itself. Yeah. Like, I it's not really explained, but this is just all of my yeah. theorizing as to what's going on, which is why I also say that, yeah, Chenard is not a Cenobite, which does then, you know, lead to this confrontation between Pinhead and the Cenobites versus Chenard.
And this is exactly what I mean with when I sat, when Hellraiser 1 had finished, I was really madly excited about watching Hellraiser 2. The end of Hellraiser 2, I sat there scratching my head like, how did I not realize that before? How did that slip by me? You know, the f like I said, the fact that Pinhead doesn't kill anybody in this and Dr. Chenard fucking annihilates everybody. He's got tentacles coming out of his hand that literally change into everything you can ever want. You know, he's got blades on the end of one. He's got drills on the end of another. I think I see one pull a finger out and do like a, a pull motion to <laughs> Tiffany and flowers. So I'm like, okay, so what is Chenard? You know, because he's got that big tentacle stuck in the back. Well, of his I love that. That that's a throwback to right at the beginning of the film where he uses a very similar looking drill bit on the on the brain yeah. during the surgery at the beginning, yeah. and it's what happens to him. And yeah, and that tentacle worm thing pretty much just enables Chenard to be wherever he, the script needs him to be. Yeah, anywhere and everywhere. It will literally float him round. But the confrontation with the Cenobites, he disposes the female Cenobite, he disposes of the Chatterer and Butterball within seconds. Within seconds, yeah. And interestingly, they turn into their human form. Anyway, um, and then for whatever reason, Pinhead just starts reverting back to his human form. He gets and, he gets shot by lasers by Chenard, I think. Chenard yeah. shoots him with a laser, which which strips strips him of his Cenobite stuff, turns him back into Captain Spencer, and then he gets his throat slit before he can do any massive damage to Chenard. Is so anticlimactic, utterly disappointing, and just so unmemorable. You know, I, I remember watching the sequence beforehand and just being fascinated by watching them turn into their human forms and, and watching Pinhead undergo the transformation that I never realised how lazy the sequence actually that's, is. That's it. That's what I found. I mean, it's, like I said, Schnard comes into the room and he just fires those spikes and it just kills off... I suppose the the meaningless Cenobites, but when you see that kid hanging on that piece of wood as it goes around, you know, it brings up more questions. I'm like, whoa, I want to know the history of the Cenobites now. I don't really give it. I like Dr. Chenard, he's a badass, but I don't really care for him that much. Well, if anything, this sequence really does just make Chenard one mean badass. Yes. If he can just wipe out the Cenobites without even really a fight. <laughs> That's how powerful this character is. And so, yeah, he does go on a killing spree throughout the hospital. The box has been opened. Yeah. Pinhead has turned it and changed it into a diamond configuration, which is the exact same shape as, as the, the Leviathan. Leviathan. Yeah. And Julia turns up. She's chasing after Kirsty and Tiffany. She ends up being... And, and that's another thing I found. Another lazy sequence there was... It was just like, okay, we need, we need attention. So what do we do? In this maze... There's going to just be a void opening up to nowhere, you know? Kirsty and Tiffany are going to be almost sucked away. Julia's going to walk up like it's no fucking big deal. But then she'll slip because of, Tiffany wants the, the, the diamond. And she'll get sucked right back out of her skin. So I'm like, so is she completely lost now to like the nothingness? And all we have left is her skin and, and the box? But it's the... I like... I liked it when I first saw it, but I don't like it anymore. It's the way they literally, they escape out into the hospital. And you sit there like, oh, it's only like an hour and 15 minutes in. And they're like, we're safe. And then that badly affected cloud sequence comes over the hospital like, no, hell is coming. Oh, the box is still open. So they've got to go back in there. And they've got to come across t uh, the skin. And you, you keep seeing the skin and you're like, that's going to become a plot point at some point, isn't it? You know, we keep seeing it, so it's going to come up again. Well, yeah, eventually Kirsty and Tiffany still running around the Hell Dimension. They come across Chenard. Chenard knocks Kirsty out again, unable to kill her. Yeah. And so then he focuses attention on Tiffany, who's desperately at this time trying to solve the box. Then Julia reappears, back in her skin, and... 
starts a make-out session with, with Dr. Ch- Chennai. He, he makes out with a lot of people in this movie. Yeah, and... But still Julia, as yeah. far as he's concerned. Yeah, yeah. And so, but lo and behold, it turns out to just be a distraction whilst Tiffany quickly reassembles the diamond box back into its square form, which then also causes the actual Leviathan, Leviathan. to turn back into the square box. form, which in turn also kills uh, Dr. Chenard, which is why I would suggest that he was tied into that Leviathan thing. Yeah, he, he gets killed because his head gets pulled off. He fires those tentacles at Tiffany. And she, did, she takes like one step back and he stabs them into the floor. And it, I... I I just don't really like this film, but the more I think about it, it just gets really silly because you just see him, you know, holding with his hands on the floor like he can't pull the blades out, but the tentacles pulling him. So it's like, what, you know, one of us has to give way. Which one of us? And it's his head. His head literally comes off the top of his so jaw. Do you think the Leviathan and, accidentally killed him while it was resetting itself? Yeah, I think, <laughs> yeah, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's a combination of both. He was stupid enough to shove his, maybe his blades are so tough. And the, I mean, he was able to fire tentacles out of his hand. Yeah, but why doesn't but he, he just turn them back into flesh? I don't know. He just could have de- de- detached them, you know. But he's like, oh, I'm not, I'm not going to. I'm, I, I'm, so, I, I, I don't have that brain input to use anymore. And the tentacles like, oh, we need to go. We need to get out of it. And it destroys him. And so then it's revealed that Julia was actually Kirsty wearing her skin. Yeah. And I'm like. What the fuck? Kirsty you was literally able to had fit in five that. seconds to from being knocked to the ground to run all the way back in this labyrinth, which you do somehow know your way around. Find Julia's skin, dress yourself head to toe, get all the way back there to save Tiffany to distract Chenard. <laughs> again, you're like what, the timing of this film. It's so obviously just b- badly done. Yeah, or not thought out properly. And like I said. You know, the whole idea of that her father was supposed to be in the film a lot more. It does explain why it's so cut and jumpy yeah. towards the end. Yeah. But Tiffany and Kirsty make their run all the way back to the hospital whilst all these blue lights go flying out. And I'm They're just the kind souls, of, I think, I, they've been picked I, up. You know, because they make like human wailing, screaming noises yeah. as they go shooting out. And for me, it's all of these escaping souls that have been tortured all this time you know, having this one moment to break free from hell whilst it's undergoing this transformation. I mean, I, I never when Pinhead turned the box into the diamond shape. Yeah. I, I don't think he ever imagined anyone to be able to solve it to turn it back unless they were a guardian. Because I don't know if he realized that that his hell dimension would undergo some fucking cataclysmic event. Yeah, yeah. Should it be solved back into the cube again, and that all these souls would escape? Wouldn't he actually want the people trapped? Wouldn't he want hell on earth? More <laughs> souls, more sending pressure? No. It's it's like, oh, I'll help. I don't know why I'm helping. The writers wrote me in to help. So, so yeah, there's a lot of things that, that still don't make sense as Kirsty and Tiffany walk off into the sunrise. Yeah. The, 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 the hospital is now being closed out. It's kind of like an Alien 3 ending where the camera is going around the <laughs> corridors. You're just seeing flowers laid on beds where people have been murdered and, you know, places being shut down. And then we follow two workers into Chenard's house. I love the fact that they actually got the same removal guy from the first film to uh, play yeah. the second yeah, film. Yeah, I thought he Because he was the one who was originally going to be Pinhead. Yeah. <laughs> and they come across the mattress. And so he's a bit weirded out by it. But then a pair of hands grab him and pull him in. So I'm wondering who that is. Well, yet again, before... You know, this film was still being made while Hellraiser 1 was released. And right. while they were already halfway through production, they went, oh shit, Pinhead's the, the, the guy everybody's loving, not Julia. Yeah. So Julia was supposed to come out of the mattress a la the Queen of Hell yeah. and start, you know, her new reign of, of horror for the next movie. Yet she also decided, I, if you make another one, I'm not, I'm coming, not coming back. back. Yeah. So they're like, okay, well, we'll just have this this box thing which has Pinhead's face on it and Julia's face yeah, on it and some skeletons and, and you know it's a pretty crappy effect where you can see the mattress is sort of cut out at a weird <laughs> angle the 80s yeah, 80s yeah. it's not it's not but a interestingly we do have the homeless man on yes. the box what is your pleasure sir? 
<laughs> yes, the ending for the Hellraiser 2 harkens back to a lot of Hellraiser 1. And I get, to, like I said, I get to the end of the film and I'm like, yay, I enjoyed that. Apart from these bits. Yeah. I, I have many memorable moments in the film. The mental hospital, as I've said, when Chenard is walking walking through mm -hmm. and we see all of these inmates. Uh, the sequence when Julia gets brought back, just very memorable. Again, yes. You know, skinless people in films are freaking horrific. And the older I get, the more horrifying it becomes. Um, the scenes with Pinhead and Kirsty, I really like. You know, because I, it does bring forth more of the lore. I don't like necessarily the transformation that he that turns Pinhead back into Elliot yeah. Spencer. I'm yeah. not so sure on that, uh, but I do like that we are given at least more backstory. Yes, I would have liked more about Chenard and more about what he's what's brought him to this point. Yeah, and what yeah. research he's discovered and found to lead him to where it is he's going. Um, and I guess my other favourite scenes are Julia and Chenard sort of wandering through hell. And, you know, she promises him such sights to show him. And all she really does is show him a random couple having sex. I think it's a random couple. I don't know who they are. Yeah. Having sex somewhere. And then she leads him to the Leviathan. So it does, it does beg for more to go in there. And I know they had a limited budget. And I really wanted to explore those corridors in mm. the first movie. And... It turns out that what's really down those corridors is a lot more fucking corridors. <laughs> so, you know, disappointing climax battle with Pinhead and, and Dr. Chenard was once the, you know, a favourite scene. Now yeah. it's memorable for its disappointment. I See, that's it. Same with Gary. A lot of the filler stuff in this film really just gets on, gets on me now, grinds on me. I watched it all the way through and... After a while, I'm just like, I'm, I'm bored. I'm, where's all the action? I remember this film being a lot more action-oriented. My favorite scenes are mainly the the stuff, the Cenobite stuff, the Leviathan stuff. You know, the birth of Elliot Spencer at the beginning. Such a brilliant, brilliant opening. And yet now I'm like, I wish you'd made it just about a prequel about him, you know? Maybe uh, maybe just a story completely covering Doctor Chenard because I love I love the creation of Doctor Chenard the way he dies and the what the first time you see him when he comes back even though I mean it's eighty so I can let it go a bit but I do love the way he just kind of floats around as a puppet you know you, his hands are able to do anything and everything so he's absolutely all powerful the fight sequence between the Cenobites and Ch Chenard it's a good confrontation. But it's just over too quickly and you just don't have any time to answer any of the questions you've been building up to that point. We have no more surprises. I still do strangely have to recommend Hellraiser 2. Yes. It is one of the better Hellraiser sequels. It was the first Hellraiser movie I ever saw. It's always going to stick with me because of its truly shocking visuals. Which I'm going to say I think still absolutely stand the test of time. Because of the anatomically correct skinless people, right. the mental asylums yeah. will always freak people out. You know, they've become a staple of, of the horror genre. The actual gore, the chains, the music, the Cenobites, everything still looks great. And it's still shot very well. I love the lighting and Christopher Young. His soundtrack for Hellraiser 2 took what he wrote for the first one and just went to town on it. It is absolutely bombastic and over the top and it needs to be because the, the first film was all set in that small claustrophobic house. Yeah. This one opens up the scale of hell, this other dimension and the size of this hospital so the music again is raised in scope and it sticks with you for a long time after the film as well. I I definitely recommend Hellraiser 2 just so that you can follow the story from the first one and it does you know, reach its conclusion. I, I definitely recommend it too. I, I'm i still a big fan of Hellraiser 2, barring all the kind of horror cliche stuff. I know it wasn't cliche back in the 80s when they first first released this movie, but the fact that you you go back and rewatch films over and over again and start to notice things. You know, I started noticing things in Hellraiser 1 that I didn't really like, and now I started doing stuff in Hellraiser 2 that I don't really like. The stuff that they were doing really well. Dr. Chenard, 
the history of the Cenobites, the expansion of the dimension that they're in, which I still question that it, to me it isn't hell. It's a it's a hell dimension, but it's not hell as we would see it with golden angels and all that kind of stuff. All that kind of stuff, the blood, the guts, the effects, the horror stuff is really, really good. But you got to get past the kind of the mute psychic puzzle maker who, you know, has so bad things going on in her life. She's not really going to die. And, and Gorman, he dies so many times. It doesn't really matter where he is as long as he's fucking dead. You know, watch Hellraiser 2 and be prepared because I... If I remember rightly, it doesn't get Because Pinhead's better. coming to town. <laughs> Shall we begin? <laughs> Thanks for watching Off The Shelf Reviews.